This is the first of 13 sessions on the geography and history of the Bible. We will be tracing the biblical text narrative all the way from Genesis all the way through Revelation. I'm Carl Rasmussen, the author of the Zondervan Atlas of the Bible. I've taught many people here in Israel over the years, and it's a place where the Bible becomes alive for them. One of the ways of viewing biblical history which is helpful is to think of the land in which God revealed himself as a playing board. If you think of the game of chess, the squares remain the same, the players on the chessboard move in a certain way all the time. However, once you start playing the game and learning the game, it's fun to learn the strategies that lead to success. Here in the land, throughout the Middle East, the playing board has basically remained the same up until the modern era. The mountains are still there, the valleys are still there, the passes are still there, the rivers are still there. And so we wanna interact, first of all, in this first unit, on the playing board. In subsequent lessons, we'll take a look at the history and play the game of history on the playing board. As we think about this area of the world, we're at the eastern end of the Mediterranean. We have a great power center off to the east of us here. The Tigris and Euphrates River, both of them over a thousand miles long, begin up in Turkey and flow through Syria and then through the modern state of Iraq into the Arabian or the Persian Gulf. This area of Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, was one of the two great power centers. People who lived along the Tigris and Euphrates River used canals. Unfortunately, the Tigris and Euphrates flooded in late spring, and it's a very hot summer and very difficult to grow crops during the summer months. So they used canals so that they could plant in the fall. Wheat and barley would grow during the winter months, and then they would harvest uh, in the spring. Transportation was not difficult in that area. Many of them would use the rivers themselves, although at some places there were rapids and that was, those would cause difficulties. One of the things that they would do oftentimes is they would walk up, for example, alongside of the Euphrates River, and then they would float back down. They weren't really able to sail so much on them because the winds weren't useful uh, in that regard. Because of the nature of their terrain, Basically, they built all their buildings out of mud, mud brick. Their palaces, their temples, the city walls, all of these things, they even wrote on mud brick, on cuneiform tablets. So in a sense, you could call it a mud culture. But this is the homeland of peoples we'll be looking at. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, uh, for example, are situated over here in the first of our great power centers. The second great power center is down to the south and to the east of the land of Israel. This would be Egypt. We have the Nile River. The Nile gives life to the whole of Egypt, flowing from south to north. The Nile River floods on a regular basis. During the summer months, it will reach its height. It goes up maybe 20 feet, something like that, before the Aswan Dam was built, flooding the fields that surround it. Because of this, it deposits massive amounts of rich soil that's been washed down. In addition, the locals will use canals in order to irrigate their fields. And this tradition has happened since 3000 BC and has continued up to the present day. Egypt is sometimes called the breadbasket of this area of the world. And it's very rich because birds pass through this area as they migrate south and north. Uh, it's very rich with fish. And so life in Egypt is somewhat a luxury life because of the life-giving forces of the Nile River. It's interesting that these two power centers were connected. If you think of Ur of the Chaldees down here in southern Mesopotamia, here is greenery over here along the Tigris and Euphrates. Up in the area of the upper Euphrates, it's an area where crops can grow, so there's agriculture there. And then if you swing down along the Mediterranean coast, you have Syria and Lebanon there, the land of Israel, and just skip over to Egypt and go down the Nile. This whole area has been aptly called the Fertile Crescent, stretching from Ur all the way down to Thebes in the south part of Egypt. It's interesting that a route that would connect all of these together, and they really didn't have long distance trade like we know it, but the route that would connect, let's say, Ur of the Chaldees with Thebes down in Egypt runs something like 1,800 miles. So it's a rather interesting distance. 
When they were building roads in this area, basically it was a very simple operation of clearing stones out of the way so that foot traffic, donkey traffic, camel traffic could pass relatively easy. It wasn't until the days of the Roman legions arriving in the first and the second century AD that real legitimate roads were built with curving and paving stones. Now, one of the things that's very important in this area of the world is you have two big influences. To the east, you have the Arabian Desert, and to the west, you have the Mediterranean Sea. And these two great areas, the desert and the sea, have an interplay here in the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Basically, we're in a desert climate. However, during the winter months, the storms come in off the Mediterranean Sea and deposit their life-giving rains here close to the edge of the land. What we find is we don't have to memorize a lot of statistics, but the further north you are, the more rain you get. The higher in elevation you are, the more rain you get. The closer you are to the Mediterranean, the more rain you would expect. And so once you, we think about these principles, we have a good idea of where people can live in order to grow crops, in order to sustain themselves. Well, what I'd like to do for a few minutes now is to focus on the land of Israel and, and on the land of Jordan. This is modern day Israel, modern day Jordan. This area has aptly been called by a friend of mine, Jim Munson, the land between. It's between the power center of Mesopotamia and the power center of Egypt. Now, one of the ways that I like to think of the land is to divide it up into five longitudinal zones. So let's look at them. The first longitudinal zones, the one closest to the Mediterranean, would be the coastal plain. Let's say stretching from Gaza in the south all the way up to Rosh Ra or the Lebanese border in the north. It's about 120 miles. This coastline is relatively flat. There's only one major port that was used in ancient times, and that was the port of Akko, which is in northern Israel. As far as the plain itself goes, if we work from south to north, we have the Philistine plain with low rolling hills. We come to a river called the Yarkon River. Once we cross that heading north, we're in the Sharon Plain area. And it's that area which, because of a line of sandstone hills very close to the shore, the waters coming down from the hill country congregated there and it was swampland. And so people needed to avoid that. But people would head north from the Philistine Plain, around the Sharon Plain, through Mount Carmel, and then to points north. Life in this area was good. We learned about transportation. It's easy to go on the low rolling hills. In terms of water sources for drinking purposes, the ancients dug cisterns that they would plaster. On occasions, they could find very, very powerful springs. And so the settlements tended to congregate where you had good water, like springs and or wells uh, or cisterns that you could use. We also find that in this area, because of the nature of the terrain, they oftentimes, like in Mesopotamia, built with mud bricks. So out here on the coastal plain, you have some very characteristic tells that we'll be talking about in subsequent lessons together. We also find in terms of life down here, agriculture was very good. You could grow wheat, you could grow barley down in this area. We also know that the caravans of the ancient world passed through this area, going from Egypt over to Mesopotamia and from Mesopotamia down to Egypt. This was good for people who were living here. They could supply the caravans with food and water and gain money from this. On the other hand, when the armies of Egypt, the Tutmos the Thirds and the Amenhotep the Seconds and the Ramses the Second went north, or you have the Sennacheribs and the tiglath pilesers heading south, this was difficult for these people because they would be oppressed by the invading armies. Our second zone, which is a very important one from the biblical standpoint, is the hill country. It's slightly to the west of the coastal plain. By hill country, I'm thinking of the area that's made out of limestone. The hills, or the mountains as some people call them, are basically 3,000 feet high. Some of them 2,000, some of them 3,000. But they stretch from Hebron in the south, going north past Bethlehem and Jerusalem, on up north towards Shechem. There's the Jezreel Valley that interrupts this line of hills, and then further north are the hills of Galilee. When you think of the area, let's use Jerusalem as an example, it's 2,500 feet above sea level. In the area of Jerusalem, this terrain is such that it forms deep V-shaped valleys. 
and it's very difficult to go up and down these valleys. What this means is that the farmers in this area using the natural limestone bedding would use terraces for their farming. Wheat and barley grow here very well. Fruit trees would grow here as well. And so the farmers in this area, be they Israelites or Canaanites, would plant on the terraces that they would keep uh, in good repair. The soil was very good, it still is. It's called terra rosa. The building material that's used up in this area is, guess what, limestone. And the limestone is a fantastic building material. They're able to cut it, they're able to shape it using chisels, and they build their houses out of it, and houses last hundreds of years, literally, because of this building material. In addition, we have to think about, well, where did they get their water? In the hill country, there are very, very powerful springs. Right around the time the Israelites arrived, the technology developed in such a way that they were able to hew out large caverns and plaster them with lime. This meant that they could hold water in these cisterns. It also meant that you didn't have to live right next to a spring. You could live away from a spring and use your cistern for your daily water supply. The hill country is high in elevation, so it gets a good amount of rainfall. As the rains come in during the winter months, they deposit their rainfall, seeps into the limestone, pays dividends in the spring. It's it during the fall of the year that the farmers are praying for rain. Once the rains begin, they plow their fields, they plant their wheat, they plant their barley. And then during the months of December, January, and February, on into March, the grain crops are growing in the hill country. It's in the spring of the year or very early summer that the grain crops are harvested. And it's at that point, the sheep and the goats that had been out in the wilderness are brought back in and they fertilize the fields and feed on the stubble that's there. So there's a very interesting combination of how the farmer and the shepherd work together. In all probability, they were part and parcel uh, of the same family. One of the tricky parts of living in the hill country is travel. Because of these deep V-shaped valleys, it's very difficult to go up and down the slopes. In the bottom of them, there are very large boulders. And so what happens in the hill country is that travel tends to be on ridges, on the tops of the mountains. They are continuous. And so what we find, for example, there's a central mountain spine. Think with me for a second. On the east, the water flows down towards the Rift Valley. On the west, it flows down towards the Mediterranean Sea. And that internal route that comes from the south to the north and vice versa is called the watershed route or the route of the patriarchs because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob traveled up and down that route. In conjunction with this travel on the ridges, one of the questions is, how do you get from the coastal plain up into the hill country? Not through the valley, but you look for a ridge and you try to climb onto a ridge and then take that ridge into the hill country. The third major zone is what we call the Rift Valley. This is a huge ditch that stretches from way up in Turkey all the way down into Africa. It is about 3,700 miles long. Literally, the earth is spread apart uh, and it's dropped down at that particular point. In the land of Israel that we're focusing on right now, it starts in the north where the Jordan has its headwaters. The Jordan will flow into the Sea of Galilee, which is actually 690 feet below sea level. It flows out of the Sea of Galilee, down towards the salt or the Dead Sea. And there at the Dead Sea, its surface is 1,200 feet below sea level, the lowest spot on the earth. So this is where the Rift Valley is located. And you can see that some of the important bodies of water are there. The Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River that the Israelites crossed, and then of course the Salt Sea uh, is there as well. So this Rift Valley continues all the way down to Africa. You might think that north-south travel happened in it, but it really didn't. Uh, it was difficult to get into it. It was difficult to get out of it. The water sources were not so good, but it's interesting Remember our principle, further north, more rain, further south, less rain. Up and down, they get about 24 inches of rain. By the Sea of Galilee, about 14 inches of rain. And then down by Jericho, or the north end of the Dead Sea, four inches, and then two inches at the southern tip of the Dead Sea. So it's a good place to just to recall that from north to south, rainfall decreases. 
Our fourth major zone is to the east of that, and these are the Transjordan Mountains. In terms of elevation, they're about as high as the mountains on the west side of the Jordan River, 3,000. They about match up one way or another. Uh, these mountains, again, are composed out of limestone, particularly uh, up in the area of Gilead. Let's think for a second how this works. If you start in the north, you're up near Mount Hermon, which is really high, 9,232 feet above sea level. South of that is the Golan Heights, and then you come to the Yarmouk River, which comes out of the area of the Golan Heights. This is a very, very, very powerful river, as powerful as the Jordan River. From the Yarmouk south, you're entering the territory of Gilead. It's separated by a biblical river called the Jabbok. And then south of that, you come to the territory of Moab with the Arnon, oh, it's a magnificent canyon. Sometimes it's even called the Grand Canyon of the Middle East. And a little bit further south is the Zered and the Edomites uh, down on the fringes of the desert. So this is the Transjordan Mountains. Rainfall, yes. What happens is the winter storms come in as the air rises, it's deposited rain on the central mountains. When the air flows down into the Rift Valley, the rains dissipate. And then over in Transjordan, for a very, very thin sliver of land, the rains start up again, but eventually they peter out because what's out there? Our fifth zone, and that is the desert. And so from that point, you're moving some 400 miles from the Transjordanian Mountains, the life-giving waters that are available there, through the very inhospitable desert until you get to the Euphrates River. It's very interesting that this land, the land between Mesopotamia, one of the great power centers, land between Egypt and how these big power centers interact, this land between is the place where God chose his people. And in some ways, we might call this God's testing ground of faith. We will examine in our coming lessons how God's people responded to life in the land. Will they trust in the true and living God? Or will they put their trust in armaments and the military might of the Egyptians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians? I invite you to join me on this visually rich journey.